But tonight I want to talk about the power of praise. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself the question, why do we sing songs at the beginning of every service? Does anybody else think that that's just kind of weird that you come in and you just sing? Does anybody understand why we sing? We, we do it because there's a benefit to it. You know, but, but the question, why, why do we do it? A lot of times we just take it for granted that that's just part of church. It's just what we do in church. We sing songs and then we listen to somebody talk. That, that's, that's a church service in and of itself. You throw in an offering and some announcements and, and maybe some prayer and, and, and that's a church service and that's just what's supposed to happen. And I think we often take for granted the power that we have in praise. And I feel like as a congregation, in order for us to move to the next level, we're going to have to start getting an understanding of the power we have through praise. Okay? Because understand, when we come in here on a Monday night and we practice songs and, and we learn new songs, that there's a reason for that. And it's not the pre-show before the preaching. It's not to entertain. It's not just to waste time so that we have a service that's longer than 30 minutes. There's a purpose in coming together, and there's a purpose in starting with praise. And that's because praise is powerful. Praise has the ability to lift you up when you're down. Praise has the ability to break the yoke of bondage in your life. Do you understand that today? Praise has the ability to set the enemy to flight. There is power in praise. In fact, your praise, your praise, has the ability to destroy the enemy. To destroy the enemy. Turn in your Bible to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and we're going to begin in verse 1. And we're going to read quite a bit of, of scripture tonight, but I'm going to try to break it up into some bite-sized portions. Mostly because I'm sure nobody wants to hear me read all of that at one time. I get tongue-tied and I can get kind of boring. So beginning in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1, when you're there, say amen. Chapter 20, verse 1. If you don't know where 2 Chronicles is, it's right after 1 Chronicles. <laughs> and the Bible says, It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon, and with them other besides the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on the side of Syria. And behold, they be in Hazatamar, sounds good to me, which is in En Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and said himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. Now understand, Moab, Moab and the Ammonites and others had set themselves to decide that they were going to destroy God's people. They were going to come in and they were going to destroy Judah. And they came to King Jehoshaphat and gave him the news and all of a sudden he was afraid. And rightfully so. Understand, Judah was just a small nation. In fact, if you read through the history, you have the tribes of Israel, which were to the north, and there were ten of those. The only tribes left in Judah were the smaller tribes that weren't up there. And as a result, when the tribes of Israel were taken away, all you had left was this small nation. And now they've got the Moabites, the Ammonites, and others coming from across the sea, all intent on one purpose, and that's putting them to death. And Jehoshaphat said, I don't know what to do. 
I have no idea what to do. How are we going to fight this large enemy? So he decided to fast and he decided to pray. Reading on in 2 Chronicles, beginning in verse 13, he says, And all Judas before the Lord, with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Do you understand that as they stood there, knowing that the enemy was coming to destroy them, they understood that it wasn't just the men who were at risk. It was their wives. It was their children. It was even the little babes. This enemy was not going to spare any when they came. It says, Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and ye shall find them at the end of the, of the brook, before the wilderness of Jeruel. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. In the process of praying and fasting, God spoke through the prophet. And basically said, go out and meet the enemy. But understand, you're not going to have to fight. Tomorrow you're going to go out to meet this large crowd who is dependent or determined to destroy you. And when you get there, understand you'll not have to fight. You'll not have to be afraid. You'll not have to, to even lift a finger because God will be with you. Verse 20, it says, And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Toka. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, that they should praise the beauty of holiness. As they went out before the army, and to say, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, everybody say praise. When they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. They were smitten. As they began to sing and praise, God fought for them, and the enemy was smitten. The enemy was smitten when they began to sing and they began to praise. That's because there is power in their praise. There was power in their praise. And understand, that's because when they began to praise, they captured the attention of God. Do you understand that when you give God praise, it gets your attention? It's because it's a sacrifice of praise. In the Old Testament, and even in the New, when someone wanted to get God's attention, they would give a sacrifice. And the moment they offered that sacrifice, it was almost as if God turned his eyes to see what was going on. You think about Elijah, when he offered 12 barrels of water in the middle of a drought. God looked down suddenly and said, what's going on there? And took note of what was happening. He took notice. When a widow woman used her last bit of flour to fix a cake for the prophet, God blessed her. God took note of her sacrifice, and the Bible says that every day she would dip her hand in and she never ran out. Every day, or actually I guess every day she ran out, but every day there was more there. 
because she would go back time and time again, and every time she dug down, there was more. God took notice of her sacrifice. When a woman used her own resources to build a house or a room for the prophet, God took notice. And a woman who was not able to bear, who was not able to bear a child, God took note and gave her favor, and she bore a son. When Jesus died on a cross, God took note. God took notice. And in each of these situations, God's responded to the sacrifice with a miracle. When Elijah offered the water, fire came down from heaven, consumed the offering, consumed the water, consumed everything that was there, even the dust, it was consumed. When the woman gave the flower, again, every day she would find more, a miracle, because as far as she was concerned, she was going to fix one last cake and go home and die. But God said, no, you're not. I got something for you every day. I got you provided. Because you were willing to give to me what you did not have, I will give you what you, <laughs> what you need. And that's what God does. When the woman built her used her resources to build a house, again, she was not able to bear. She had been barren. And all she ever wanted was a child, and God gave her a son. And so much more that when the son got sick and started to die, that she ran back to the man of God and said, what have you done to me? That this child that you've promised me has now died. I just said, no, he's not dead. Went upstairs and laid upon the child, and all of a sudden he was healed. Because the woman was willing to give a sacrifice to God. It gets his attention. And we all know that when Jesus died on the cross, the miracle of salvation happened. As the veil was torn from the top to the bottom and we were able to now enter into the presence of God, a miracle happened. A miracle happened when he rose three days later. And miracles still happen. We no longer have to offer the blood of bulls and goats as sacrifices, but the Bible says we offer the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips. Now understand what that means. That doesn't mean, God, I really don't want to praise you, but I'll sacrifice. I'll make a sacrifice because I don't have it to give you, but I'll praise you anyway. No, that's not what it means. A sacrifice is the same thing. It's saying, God, I know that you've blessed me with all of this, and I'm going to give you praise for it. I'm going to praise you for it. It's going to be my sacrifice. It's going to be my sacrifice of praise. And when we offer up that sacrifice of praise, it gets God's attention. And when we come into this place, we sing songs because we need to get God's attention. I want him to take note of where I am. I want him to look down and say, oh, there is that sweet sound that I long for. That's what God is requiring of us. The fruit of our lips. When we offer sacrifice of praise unto God, He takes note. And we begin to create an atmosphere conducive for miracles. When you begin to lift your voice, you create an atmosphere where God can move. You create an atmosphere where He says, Oh, i got to go down and see what's happening I want to be a part of that. And what happens is we begin to, to create an atmosphere for miracles because we begin to invite his presence into this place. Your praise is an invitation to God that says, God, please leave your holy habitation and come and dwell among us right here in this place. It says, God, you don't have to stay up in heaven to hear praise. You can come right down here where I am and I'll give it all you need. And God wants to be in that presence. He wants to be in that place. So when we begin to praise, God takes note. And he says, I'm being invited into that place. And I want to be there. I want to be in that place. And there is power in your praise. The Bible said God inhabits praise. 
He inhabits praise. So when we praise him, he shows up. It's like we create a throne in which he can come and sit upon. A throne of praise. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Praise brings you into the courtroom of God. You enter into his gates with thanksgiving with a, God, I'm thankful for what you did for me. I'm thankful for how you kept me. I'm thankful for all this stuff, but I just want to praise you because of who you are. Not because of what you've done, not because of what you've given, but because of who you are. I just praise you. And when you begin to praise, it brings you into the courts of God. The place where his throne is. And he begins, when you get into that place, then you are able to approach his throne of grace with boldness and let your request be made known. When you enter into his presence, it gives you an opportunity to come before the king and to begin to share with him what you need. Hebrews 4, 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jehoshaphat was in a time of need. His entire kingdom was about to be destroyed. He had need. And he learned that I can come into the throne of grace through my praise. And when I do, I can find grace to help. I can find the grace to help in my time of need when I can come to him in praise. And that's the reason that he set people to praise. If you read through the Bible, before they ever went out to battle, they always set forth people to praise in the front of the army. And many times, many times, when they arrived at the battlefield, God had already gone before them and destroyed the enemy. Many of them heard the singing and the praising and thought, oh my goodness, they have more people than we thought they did. And would run and turn and flee, leaving behind everything that they had brought. Judah was in need. So they lifted up their voices and God joined with them and the enemy. There's power in your praise. Because your praise has a liberating power. Your praise has the ability to set people free. Because again, God gets you, your praise gets his attention and he comes and dwells where you are. And the Bible says where the presence of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is liberty in the presence of the Lord. The enemy cannot stand in the presence of the Lord. When the Lord comes in, the enemy must go out. Because where he is is light, and where, where light is, there can be no darkness. The enemy must flee. You have a freeing effect. It can free you from sadness. It can free you from bondage. It can free you from oppression. It can free you from your situation. I believe it was the Bible who told a story about two men who had been beaten and thrown in jail and left there. And the Bible says it was about midnight when they began to lift their voice and began to praise the Lord. And as they worshiped and as they praised and as they sang unto the Lord, the place was shaken. And the gates flew open. And they were set free. Do you understand that your praise has the ability to set you free? When you feel like, God, I just can't do anything else. I feel so oppressed. I feel like the enemy is pressing upon me. If you will begin to praise the Lord, if you will begin to praise the Lord, it can change your situation like that. When you feel like, God, I can't go another step, if you'll begin to praise the Lord, it will change your mindset. It will change your being. It will change the entire atmosphere of where you are because when you begin to praise, God joins you right there, right where you are. 
Does anybody else feel like any time you turn on the radio and you start singing some good Christian music that all of a sudden something just changes? Yeah. It's because you're inviting the presence of God to right where you're at. And it begins to liberate. It begins to set you free. But not just you. It begins to set the other people around you free. If you can create the atmosphere of praise then understand the people that are around you will be affected by the atmosphere that you create. If you can learn to praise in the midst of that place that is so hell-bent, your workplace, your school, maybe even your own home, if you can learn to praise God in the midst of that place, I can guarantee you the entire atmosphere will change. The entire atmosphere will change. People will be mad. People will be disgruntled and everything else. And you just start, I, I dare you to just start singing some praise unto the Lord. And if for no other reason, people will shut up because they're like, that guy's crazy. <laughs> they will stop fighting. They will stop arguing. If for no other reason than so that they could talk about you. And it will bring so much unity as they all focus on you and talk about how crazy you are. But understand, it will change the atmosphere. And people will begin to be set free from whatever it is that's oppressing them. Whatever it is that's holding them back. Just like Paul and Silas. There's power in your praise. And that's because the enemy cannot stand in the midst of your praise. He cannot stand. When Judah began to praise, the enemy began to destroy itself we read in the Bible. They started to turn on each other. And all of a sudden, they were they just showed up and they were like, man, everybody's already dead. Everybody was already dead. Dead bodies laying everywhere. And they were probably thinking, who did that? But they had turned on themselves. Because understand, your praise confuses the enemy. Especially when you praise in the midst. When he comes to attack you, he wants you to quit. He wants you to give up. He wants you to become depressed. He wants you to become discouraged. And he comes in, and he's going to watch what happens. They're going to panic. They're going to they're gonna just freak out. And all of a sudden, in the midst of that attack, you begin to praise the Lord. And he goes, what? That's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to run. You're supposed to hide. You're supposed to be paralyzed and not do anything. It's confusing to the enemy because he doesn't understand how you can have so much faith in God to be able to sing in the midst of a trial. In the midst of an attack, how can you possibly want to sing? That doesn't make sense to him. And he is confused by that. And that's what happened in this situation. The enemy had come against them, and they began to praise the Lord, and all of a sudden the enemy was so confused that they started turning on each other. And they were other. It says Ammon and Moab got together and destroyed Syria. And then once they were done with that, they were still so confused, they started killing each other. So that when they showed up, there was nothing left of the enemy. Because there was power in their praise. There's power in praise. There's power in your praise. Understand he wants you to quit. He wants to discourage you. But if you'll praise the Lord, it will bring so much confusion and chaos to him that by the time it's all said and done, you've won the victory. When you arrive at the battle, you've already won the victory because he's won it for you. Chapter 20, verse 24 says, and when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, they were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away, and they were three days in gathering the spoils. It was so much. 
because they were willing to praise God in the midst of the attack, God destroyed them and gave them the victory, and not only gave them the victory, but gave them the spoil of the victory. We are at war with the enemy. And the enemy has already determined that he was going to come at us from any angle he possibly could. But if we will learn to praise him, to come into this place and lift our voices, do you understand that this very night the enemy has fought against you? He has fought against us. And in some instances, he won because there are people who were supposed to be here who weren't. Because for whatever reason, the enemy kept them at home. We are in a battle. The reason we sing every service is because we want to create an atmosphere. We want to invite the presence of God into this place so that the enemy will be put to flight so that we can have the spoil of the souls of men. Because that's really the prize. We're fighting for the souls of men and women. Children. That is the spoil. That is what's left when the enemy flees. Because when he flees, he leaves behind all the souls that he once held captive. And then all we need to do is walk along and pick them up. Dust them off. And claim the spoil of the victory. We never have to lift a finger to fight the enemy. In fact, it wouldn't do any good. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what we wrestle against. So it doesn't matter if I come in with a, with a uh, Glock 9. It's not going to harm him. I can come in with a big brave heart sword, and it's not going to do a single thing. But if I will learn to praise him, it will send him into nervous fits and turn him against his own self. The enemy tries to bring destruction. He tries to keep people from receiving the message. He'll bring distraction in the midst of the service. He'll come up and he will sit in the front row if he's so inclined. But you know what? Praise will set him to flight. And that's why it's important. If we will learn to lift our voices and begin to offer him the sacrifice of praise, then we will find that we don't have to fight the enemy. He will fight himself, and he will flee. And when he does, he'll leave behind the souls of men and women. That's our spoil. There's power in your praise. That's why we take the time to sing God's praise at the beginning of these services. Again, not to entertain, not to give you something to tap your toe for. We do it because we need the presence of God. Without his presence, what we do is in vain. We have got to learn the power of praise. We do it because the enemy is real and there are souls at stake. We want God's presence. We need his power. We need to create that atmosphere where people can be set free. Everywhere God goes, there's praise. In fact, around his throne, there's continuous praise. Anytime you see anybody who's caught a glimpse of the throne of God, whether it's Isaiah, who saw two cherubs and they sang back and forth, holy, holy, holy. Or whether it's John's when he sees them sitting before the throne of God singing day and night worthy is the lamb understand God is in a continuous part of praise like I said earlier the reason that the very rocks would cry out is because Jesus Christ himself is God incarnate and if they had ceased to praise him God's character demands praise his goodness demands praise. So if they weren't willing to do it, the very rocks themselves would have had to do it. Because God is never without praise. Do you understand what praise is? 
praise is voicing your approval. When your child comes in and shows you that paper that they did. And you say, oh, that is so good. You did an excellent job. Look, you stayed in the lines and everything. That is so great. Here, I'm up. That's praise. You're praising them. When When your dog comes in and they sat or they laid down or they didn't mess on the carpet. And you say, oh, you're just so good. I'm just such a good girl. That's a good girl. That's praise. If you can praise your children, and if you can praise your dog, then explain to me why we have so much trouble praising God, who has been nothing but good. Nothing but good good there is so much that we can pray for there is so much that we can praise him for but yet oftentimes when it comes to the being able to do that our favorite position is this and this is our position of praise when it comes to god and i'm not saying if you can't stand that's fine we went to church with a gentleman who had a had been stricken and was not able to walk. In fact, he was pretty much paralyzed from his neck down. He could lift his arms about this high. But every single service, you could look at him and his hands were this high. That's all he could do. But he understood the power of praise. People that we would look at and say, I don't understand how they would even want to praise God. Look at them. Look at the situation they're in. How could they praise God for that? And yet here we are, so blessed. And we act like we can't do anything to praise God. God has been nothing but good. You can praise God for anything, for who he is. You can praise him because he saved you. Praise him because he healed you. Praise him because he delivered you. Praise him because he kept you. Praise him because he woke you up this morning. Praise him because he woke you up in your right mind this morning. Praise him for his mighty works. Praise him because of his faithfulness. Praise him love because of his mercy because of his grace because of his patience with you praise him because he's worthy praise him because he's God whatever the reason praise him because when you do you capture his attention and the moment you capture his attention he has nothing more than to to be where you are in the midst of your purpose and he will come down and he will dwell right with you and you watch the entire atmosphere of what's going on in your life change God begins to move to fight the enemy for you through your praise and all of a sudden you are set free and you're liberated and the enemy is no longer standing because you are able to praise in the midst of the attack God is looking for a generation who will stand up and who will praise Him in the beauty of holiness. I don't have time to go into it tonight. But do you understand that God wants your praise? It does not matter what you did today. It does not matter what you will do tomorrow. God desires your praise. He wants your praise. God is calling us to a higher level of praise. To go beyond just singing songs to one another. And to really begin to focus the words that we say and the songs that we sing towards him. When we sing the song and we sing about praise rising, 
hearts turning to you. Don't let them be vain words. Sing them to him. Sing them to him. With all your heart, with all your soul, praise him. Don't sing it so that the person next to you can hear how great you sound. Because your praise isn't for them. Maybe you couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. You sing anyway. Because again, your praise isn't for that person sitting next to you. It's for him and him alone. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Clap your hands, O oh ye people. God wants to hear us. Wants to hear you praise him. Because there's power in your praise. Power in your praise. And if you have the power to set the end, what's the Bible say? One ascend a thousand to flight, and two can send ten thousand. What can 50 do? <laughs> what can 50 do? We can do what's needed. We can do what's sufficient. God wants to hear your praise tonight. As we begin to close tonight, I just want to, I don't think we should be able to preach about something like this without giving you the opportunity to praise him.